So my name is Mark Trainer. I am the owner of Liberty Recovery. If you're interested in knowing exactly the status of my sex addiction um, certificate, I am an associate sex addiction therapist. Uh, I technically am a candidate. I just haven't finished all the paperwork, but I have met all the criteria. I have taught for over 20 years. Um, I have in a variety of settings. I've also been supporting people with sex addiction for the last 20 years. Um, this area is incredibly fortunate in that we have the Keystone Center ECU, which is a residential treatment facility in Chester, Pennsylvania. As far as I know, so it's a residential, it's basically a rehab for um, people, specifically men is all that they've been treating the last couple of years with sexual compulsivity. And as far as I know, they are the only residential treatment facility north of Tennessee and east of Utah. So if you made like a 90 degree angle. So the fact that we have this um, treatment facility so close to us is, is really unusual. And I worked there for about five years um, as the intake coordinator. Um, so let's talk about sex addiction. First of all, in the um, chat, I'm wondering if you could just throw in there, I'm wondering if there's, I'm assuming that most of us are from Delaware. So I'm curious to know who is not from Delaware. If you wanna throw in your state or your country, that would be great to see. Um, thank you, I see all the Maryland's. Um, you know, when we think about an addiction, it really, I, I think we can all um, agree that there are different components to it. And I think we can all agree that some people have addictive behavior. And I think we can all agree that perhaps not everybody, whether you're an addict or not, I think the addiction model can be very helpful for a lot of people. So I'm working with the understanding that addiction involves compulsion, tolerance, and withdrawal. And that typically, um, I like to think of addiction um, I like to think of a, two different types of addiction. One's your substance abuse and the other's the behaviors. So the behaviors we sometimes refer to as process addictions. Um, and that often includes um, sex, love, relationships, gambling, food, workaholism, things like that. Um, let me just change this a little bit. Okay. So when we look at the addictive cycle, we have triggers, preoccupation, fantasies. It falls into a ritualization, acting out, despair and unmanageability. Um, there's often the commitment to not acting out, again, is over here. Um, with someone with sex addiction, it can fall under similar lines, the trigger being either seeing something um, sexual or, you know, I think sex addicts fall under the same hungry, angry, lonely, tired can be their triggers. The preoccupation and the fantasy of trying to either get A, get around filters, B, thinking about connecting with an affair partner, things like that. The ritualization, for some people, a ritualization might look like um, if they struggle with the internet, their ritualization might, might start with, say, um, watching TV. And from watching TV, they go to movies, from watching movies, I'm talking about just kind of flipping through the channel, they then move on to, um, you know, trying to find sexualized scenes in the movies, and then they can move on to outright pornography. And so if someone struggles with a pornography addiction, that becomes the acting out, they have their despair on manageability, they often will commit to not acting out again, being sober, and then they find themselves in another triggering situation. So I think that in that regard, sex addiction is very similar to other addictions. I'm curious if you guys can put in the chat, I'm curious to know how many clients would you have identified with sex addiction? Um, the first question is, how many do you think you have right now? And then the second question is, how many think you've had in, say, the last five years? 
um, the some of the statistics that I've read in terms of people meeting the real criteria or the proposed criteria for the DSM-5 um, is roughly around 5% of the population may fall under having um, compulsive sexual behaviors. The, so if, if that's true, if we just go with that 5% of the population have a sexual compulsivity, then that would mean if you have 20 clients, one of them is a sex addict. Um, oh, my screen's not moving up. Okay. <laughs> I was like, wow, why isn't anyone answering my question? Okay, three now, one now. Okay. So, and the other thing, when I think of it that way, you know, I forget what percentage off the top of my head are people that have a generalized anxiety disorder. So I'm just gonna completely make something up because I really don't know. But if let's say that 10% of the population has a generalized anxiety disorder, then I know that as clinicians, we often find that we have a higher than just 10% would really struggle with anxiety. So um, Rob, you have 15, we should definitely catch up. Um, so if, if, if therapists tend to have a higher proportion of people that are seeking therapy, if it's 5% of the general population, then I think often we would find that our clients may be more than 5%. Um, so, all right. One of the things that's interesting about sex addiction, along with um, other behavior addictions, is there's always the question about the difference between OCD and addiction. Um, OCD, I think people with behavior addictions very often look remarkably similar to OCD, but there are some um, differences. So for instance, with the OCD, we have the obsessions, the unwanted thoughts and images, avoidance of triggers, compulsions, and rituals. With addiction, we can have an intense urges for the substance or the behavior, using more to get the same effect. Oh, sorry. Using more to get the same effect, an inability to stop despite the negative consequences and the withdrawal symptoms. Um, I think often when people with behavior addictions look at the OCD criteria, they will often say, oh yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me. That's totally not me, that's totally not me. And they'll find that they really can be different. Um, so I'm curious if people can start throwing in the chat, what do you think a sex or love addict looks like? Like what would be some of the, what would be some of the characteristics of sex and love addiction? What do you think would be some telltale signs that you would hear and say, wow, that sounds like sex and love addiction. Love bombing, I love it. Um, for those of you who don't know what love bombing is, that's often when you're kind of showering someone with love and affection, um, a lot of porn, attachment issues. I agree with all of this, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's see. So with sex addiction, we have definitely keep um, putting in the, the thoughts in the chat. With sex addiction, I think of that as behavior that's focused on sex rather than a person or relationships. The easy one is porn uh, or if someone struggles with um, prostitution, anonymous sex, things like that. To give an interesting perspective um, with the sex addiction, um, I'm thinking of a guy that I know who was a full-blown chronic alcoholic. He was married to a woman and he found himself compulsively having anonymous sex with men. When I heard his story, he was having so much anonymous sex with men I know that in many cases, 
you know, people enjoy that. And if that's what you enjoy, then that's fine. But if you feel like it's becoming problematic and you're trying to stop and you can't stop, that's when we start wondering if it's an addiction. This guy that I know went up and saw um, Bob Dilbeck, who was a wonderful clinician up in the media area. And Bob really helped him find some peace with the fact that he was probably just gay. And then I think in the long run, he really came to identify it as someone who was bisexual, but had a much stronger preference for men. And at that point, all of the behavior stopped. In my mind, that's a perfect example of someone who's an alcoholic, but he's probably not a sex addict at all. So even though all these things that I'm hearing, like Matthew, you wrote no inhibitions. He had no inhibitions whatsoever. Uh, Jim, you said the preoccupation, the intrusivity, absolutely. He had all of those things. And once he learned to find some peace with his orientation, it all went away. In my mind, that's by definition, not an addict. Um, if someone is going to therapy and working on their attachment disorders, if they go to therapy and they're working on their trauma, if they go to, um, they find some peace, then if they find some peace with some of their early childhood experiences or their adverse childhood experiences, and they still have that compulsivity, I tend to think of that's how you know it's more of an addiction. When people look at sex addiction, they often look at it as sex and love addiction. Um, there's actually a 12 step group that's called Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. They have a pretty good group here in the um, Delaware area. With the love and relationship addiction, it's an attraction or desire for someone to the detriment of their self. That's usually the key definition. It's the, um, they're doing things to their own detriment. They're setting aside their own personal needs and wants to fulfill the wants and needs of the other person. It's an unhealthy dependence. With the love addiction, it is um, usually focused on one person and a relationship addiction is it's going from one relationship to another. Um, I feel like now's probably a good time. Um, does anyone have any quick questions about stuff like that? We're gonna start getting into some other of the official diagnoses, but if you have any simple questions and you wanna throw it in the chat, um, we'll see if we can address at least some of them as we're going through the presentation. Um, all right. If there's one thing that I'm going to encourage you to get out of this presentation is the shame that goes along with sex addiction. Um, shame is shame is the rocket fuel for sex addiction. Um, I see your question about the definition. It's I think that's the one thing that people often don't realize is how profound um, the shame is in terms of the underlying behaviors. I know that some people go with the definition that guilt says that I did something wrong, shame says that I am wrong. And the sense of shame that goes with love, sex and love addiction is so profound it's usually like a cloud that fills everything. Um, the definition of sex addiction that I follow is we're gonna get to the ICD definition, but it's basically looking at the behavior of that follow these trends. There's a compulsivity, there's a tolerance, there's a withdrawal. Um, you know, there's a continuation of the behavior despite the consequences. Um, so we will definitely, I'll, I'll show you what the ICD definition is. I, I actually, I like it tremendously. So one of the questions that people have is, 
if these people have so much shame as a therapist that's saying that the prob person probably has a sex addiction, aren't I just adding to that shame by giving them a label? Isn't that the exact opposite of sex positivity? And so that was one of the things that I wanted to uh, address. With sex negativity, um, I like the idea that it's making judgments about other people's behavior. It's equating sexuality or certain types of sex with deviance, abnorm abnormality, or risk. Uh, the idea that sex is inherently bad, um, dangerous, sinful, dirty, shameful, and it should only be with procreation, marriage, and love. I think, Rob, you had talked about it being in, um, a big component with the faith community, and there is a component to that. You know, they look at their own behaviors and their behaviors aren't in line with their own values. Um, with sexual pos positivity, I got this from the HIV Learning Network. I really liked it. Um, I certainly would love to see in the chat if people had some different thoughts on it. This is saying that sex positivity is an attitude towards human sexuality that regards all consensual sexual activities as fundamentally healthy and pleasurable and encourages sexual pleasure and experimentation. The sex positive movement is a social and philosophical movement that advocates these attitudes. The sex positive movement advocates for sex education and safer sex as part of its campaign. And so in that context, sex addiction looks like it's definitely going against that idea of sex positivity. But I like to look at it as these slides. If sex positivity is like the Beastie Boys, you have the right to party, the, the difference is like alcoholism. Yes, as an alcoholic, you do have a right to party, but it's probably become problematic at this point. Another example is Whitney Houston, I Will Always Love You, a wonderful song. I think it was from the 90s. Um, feel free to correct me. And as, again, as opposed to gambling, you know, I, as a gambling counselor, I was just working with a client who said she just loves to gamble. It is so much fun for her to gamble. She loves sitting at the casinos. She loves sitting at the slot machine. It's a chance for her to just tune out, have fun, you know, be in the atmosphere of like the people. Sometimes I think it's Friday nights. Um, they often have music there. I don't know if the music's there regularly, but she really likes the atmosphere and she really likes to sit there. However, she's probably lost tens of thousands of dollars and she knows that she needs to stop. She knows that she needs to stop and she is unable to stop at this point. So when we look at our sex positivity, you know, in one regards, we can say, well, you know, I think it's important to let loose, have some fun, maybe go to the casinos, but once you get to the point where it's like alcoholism or gambling, it's no longer, this is no longer about having a positive attitude towards the behavior. This is getting to the behavior that it's really detrimental. When we're looking at the, um, the shame addiction, I'm sorry, the sex addiction, for instance, if you're looking at pornography for eight hours a day, that's no longer, that might no longer be, that sex positivity might not be a model that would be helpful with that. So another question that people often have is what's the difference between sex addiction and sex offending? And they often think of the two as being the same. When someone hears sex addict or sex offender, they automatically think of pedophilia or they think of rapists or they think of flashers. And what I would like to argue is that someone who struggles with sexual addiction is on a continuum, just like sex offending. In a lot of ways, it really has to do with values. So for instance, as if someone is looking at pornography at three o'clock in the morning when the kids are sleeping, 
that may be going against their values as uh, a parent. Or if someone is committed to being in a monogamous relationship, but they're having affairs, they may not be doing anything illegal, but it's still they're violating and offending their own values. So on one side of sex addiction, I don't think you can really have sex addiction and have it not go against your values and goals. But let's pretend that with sex addiction, if you were to go all the way to one side, this person would have pure addiction and offends nobody or nothing. And on the far side of the spectrum, we have the person who's engaging in illegal activities. That's your like violent, random uh, person who's sexually assaulting people at the parks. Most people do not fit all the way on one side or the other. Um, they're usually somewhere on this spectrum. And so the biggest thing that I think I would encourage with sex addiction and sex offending is that while there might be a lot of overlap, they are fundamentally two different um, concepts and two different behaviors. Does anyone have any questions about the sex addiction, sex offending, and sexual positivity before we go on? Okay. If anything comes to mind, just put it in the chat. I'll see if I can get to it. The interesting thing about the DSM-5, um, do we all know that hypersexuality used to be in the DSM-3? Um, if you didn't, it used to be in the DSM-3. DSM-3 had both hypersexuality and homosexuality as a mental illness. They decided to take it out for the DSM-4. It's my understanding that the reason why they took it out of the DSM was that they were afraid that people were going to use it as an excuse for sexually offending behaviors. So you could say, um, what I did is I, I'm not someone guilty of sexual assault because I have a compulsivity and the compulsivity led me to having too much sex. And this person, despite them saying, no, I have a disability. So it's my understanding that's why it was taken out. For the DSM-5, they thought about putting it in the DSM-5 uh, Dr. Rory Reed was one of the lead researchers on, um, on the committee to see if it should be added to the DSM-5. And at the time, they decided that there just wasn't enough evidence to support it. I think people will often say that, yes, sexual compulsivity can be a very real issue. However, the question is, is it a real mental illness or not? Uh, Rory Reed wrote a, a really interesting article on why it was not added to the DSM-5. Some of the reasons why he gave was a fear of false positives. So I think, um, I think it was Rob. Rob, you had talked about the um, religious communities and spirituality, um, I think. The, the fear is that if you're engaging in a behavior that goes against your values, everything that we do, thank you, everything that we do, if it goes against our values, might be problematic, but that doesn't mean that it's an addiction. You know, I, I often eat way too many Oreos, but I don't know if I really cross that addiction into really considering myself a food addict. I may have problems with eating too many Oreos, but I don't know if pathologizing my use of the Oreos would really be accurate. The same thing with the sexual um, positivity or the sex positive movement. It's too easy to pathologize someone's, um, Pam, the golden Oreos, they are good, but I, I gotta say, I really like the chocolate ones. But anyway, you do you. Um, <laughs> the, you know, pathologizing sexuality, that, that can really be a very real issue. You know, just because someone um, 
someone's into different sexual behaviors and they like different sexual behaviors, doesn't mean that we really have the right to say what's considered sick and what's not. If you look at the paraphilic disorders, which we're about to talk about, you know, a lot of that is built upon the idea of it really going against what you want to do or it's offending other people. And so that's another reason why it was not added. Um, symptoms with other disorders. I know of um, when Rory Reed, he came to Philadelphia and um, he met with someone named Cara Tripodi over at STAR. And they tested a lot of, um, they tested a lot of people. And a lot of those people that identified as sex addicts really had other disorders. It was better described as particularly bipolar. When people go manic, they often become um, hypersexual. And so if someone's bipolar and hypersexual, it's probably to describe their, better to describe their behavior as bipolar than to say that they're simply a sex addict. At the time, there was also a lack of scientific evidence and um, perfectionism, I think, would kind of correlate to what I'm saying in terms of perfectionism can be a devastating um, problem for families. It can ruin fam families, can ruin careers, jobs, everything. However, perfectionism itself is not a mental disorder. OCD might is a mental disorder, but perfectionism in itself is not. Um, Mark, you're catching those questions, right? We have two in there. Yeah, I see. Great question. Sarah, how are kinks considered normal versus relating to an underlying issue? Sarah, I think that's a great question. The first thing that comes to mind is if someone thinks that it's a problem or not, you know, if someone's into S&M and they like it and they're not hurting anyone, that to me sounds great. You know, you do you. Um, if someone is engaging in S&M and they can't stop or they feel like it, um, yeah, it's, I think the biggest one is if it really goes against their values and they can't stop is how I would suggest it might be an underlying issue. Um, I know someone that has a, uh, a glove fetish. It's very interesting. And with him, he does have a sex addiction. He definitely has a sex addiction, but you can't just get rid of your sexuality. Your sexuality is tied in with your orientation, with your gender identity. It all overlaps. And so in his case, he had to learn how to have a different relationship with his sexuality, which included the glove fetish. He didn't get rid of the glove fetish. He just learned how to have healthy boundaries with it. And the last I heard was that he was looking for a partner who could appreciate his fetish and not help him feel shamed. Um, Roy, you said, Sarah, tell me if that answers your question. Roy, you said, do you have a ballpark percentage of actors in porn who are involved in porn as a result of being abused or financial gains or as a result of threats? Um, Roy, I think that's a brilliant question. And I think that's a very real problem. Um, in terms of pornography, many people say if it's between consenting adults, then it's not a problem. And on that level, I would agree with you. If someone wants to engage in sexual behavior and they want to record it or perform it, if that's what they wanna do, then that sounds great. But let's take a look at, um, Roy, you had said results of being abused. I have heard statistics that said 90% of all women that engage in the adult entertainment industry were sexually abused at some point in their life. And so what they're doing is when they were a child, something was stolen from them. And so then now as someone who's an adult, they feel like, well, I can just flash a little skin and you're going to give me money and you're going to do what I want to say, or you're going to do what I say. And in that regard, they feel empowered. So as a child, something was stolen from them. And now as an adult, they feel empowered by... I'm gonna do a little bit of this and then you're gonna act like a dog in front of me. I've heard that that was 90%. I have read other reports that said that that was absolutely, 
ridiculous. And it's more like 60%. Well, there is a big difference between 60 and 90%. But if you look at the people that are compulsively looking at pornography, they are probably looking at possibly thousands and thousands and thousands of images over a lifetime. 60% of thousands and thousands of thousands is still thousands and thousands and thousands. So that becomes one of the, the dynamics that I think people that struggle with porn addiction is that they are witnessing someone reenacting their own trauma with the false understanding or, well, I would argue false, but maybe not. I don't know. Maybe this is a way for them to work through their issues. Um, but they're participating by watching it. In result of the threats, that's a very real issue with massage parlors. Um, it is a very well-known fact that a lot of those Asian massage parlors, I have no idea how many, but it is a known fact that many of the massage parlors that are in the Delaware area are typically... They are women that are brought here under false pretenses of being um, maybe an au pair, or maybe being a worker. And when they get here, they don't speak the language. The people take their passport. They tell them that, you know, I brought you here for $5,000. You now need to work off that money. And if you are not giving people sexual favors, I will tell your family that you came to America to become a prostitute. That in my mind, is sexual slavery. And that is happening in the Delaware area. To answer your question though about ballpark percentages of people in the massage parlors, I really have no idea what that is, but I do know that um, I do know that, that exists. Gary, you said, how would you handle a kid who might be gay, but it goes against his and his parents' relig religious values? Gary, I think that's a brilliant question. I think it's a brilliant question. And I also believe that you do not get to choose what your sexual orientation is. It is what it is. In that case, um, I guess you can live a life where you might have a sexual attraction to people, but you do not engage in that sexual behavior. Um, but I really can't see any way around that. I do not believe that there's a cure for someone's orientation, whether it's gay or a straight. I mean, you can't convince someone who's straight to be gay. So I don't know why people would think that you can convince the other way. I think conversion therapy has shown to be remarkably dangerous. I think it has been shown to have high incidence of suicidal ideation and suicide for that matter. Um, and so, Gary, I think you're asking a brilliant question, and I can't really think of any other answer than you just need to learn to accept that you're gay. Um, I wish I could have a better answer, and I don't. Um, so let's talk about the ICD-11. So right now, we're on the ICD-10. ICD-11 it's my understanding it has been published, it has been put into usage, and it's my understanding that it is not being used in America. Um, excuse me. We had an earlier question. I don't remember the person who's, um, who had asked it previously, but the question is, she had asked, what is the definition of sex addiction? And of course, now I can't really see my screen. So um, if we can read the top, we have the repetition is a central focus of the individual's life. There are numerous unsuccessful efforts to control or significantly reduce the behavior. It continues to engage in repetitive sexual behavior despite the adverse consequences. Um, in my mind, that's, you know, along these lines, it's like we're, we keep this sounds remarkably similar to other addictions, whether it be gambling or substance abuse. Um, often there is little satisfaction, either none or no satisfaction from it. So the person may act out with a prostitute and then they immediately are looking for another prostitute or they, if someone's engaging in pornography, 
they may watch pornography for five hours, they may masturbate, and then they immediately go back into looking into more pornography. With relationships, addictions, it's the same thing. It's boom, 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 boom. Um, it has to occur over a period of time. They say it's ice, um, six months or more. It's not better accounted for by another medical disorder, such as the bipolar. And then I think this is really the key. It's the last one that really, I think, answers the previous question. The sexual behavior results in marked distress or significant impairment in personal, family, social, educational, occupational, or other important areas of function. However, that distress or distress that is entirely unrelated to moral judgments and disapproval about sexual impulsive urges or behaviors is not sufficient to meet this requirement. So if someone is engaging in behavior that, the way I read that, if someone is engaging in behavior that goes against their values, that doesn't necessarily make you a sex addict. And I think that's really the difference between the this issue is that it is going against your values. You are offending your values. You are offending the values of the, your family or the community. However, it's not just about the values. Uh, let's see. So Sarah, you said, we went away. Let's try this again. Why do people have a hard time accepting that sexuality is on a spectrum versus can view other topics as not being only black and white? <laughs> Sarah, I think it's such a brilliant question. Um, I don't know if I have an answer for that, but I believe um, you just so nailed um, so many parts of this conversation. Um, let's see, the next one says, trying to understand why a boy child who is sexually assaulted by the same sex is willing to look at pornographic men photos and be attracted to men. I would have thought that a child is assaulted by that sex, it would push them away from trusting or liking the same sex. That is an awesome question. And the reason why I think that that question becomes so interesting is that I know someone that is a therapist. He's incredibly comfortable with his orientation. He is a sex addict and he compulsively acts out with anonymous men who are you know, bigger than him, physically larger than him. He does it very compulsively. When I asked him it, about his sexual orientation, he was telling me that it was reenactment of his trauma. When I asked him, you know, do you think you're gay? And he was like, no, no, I think, I think I'm bi. And then he was like, you know, I don't even think I'm bi, I think I'm straight, but I'm engaging in this compulsive behavior. So I think what happens is, that's an example of how we have a template. The quote unquote normal template would be that, you know, as a young child, you're curious about sexuality, you're often curious about the other gender, and you're curious. Maybe you play doctor, maybe you do something along those lines. When you turn 12 years old, you are, um, maybe you have your, your first kiss, maybe you play spin the bottle at like 13, 14, and then you're 18 and you have your first, like what we would call quote unquote mature sexual relationship. I do realize that the language I'm using is um, in very broad strokes and that there's lots and lots of exceptions of how I'm describing this. And, um, please don't think that I'm trying to come across as judgmental. It's just, I'm, I'm trying to be able to communicate an example. If someone has sexual trauma at a young age, it often changes their template. So if someone's template was, you know, for them to be attracted to the other gender, their template changes as they get older. So when someone had a crush on someone in their class in sixth grade, 
Hopefully as they get older, they no longer have a crush on sixth graders. Hopefully they're, um, the people that they're sexually attracted to will change, but they still have the same template. So in a, a broad stroke, one template could be either a, an attraction to men or women or both. And that would be an example of a template. Um, if I can use myself as an example, um, I clearly look Irish, Irish Catholic. Half of my family is Italian though. I have always dated Italian women. Um, it's just, it's a thing. I don't know. It's a thing. I also have a template for really smart women. I've only dated really smart women. Um, my wife graduated, I think either number one or number two in her class. She graduated summa cum laude with a 4.0 average to become, get her master's degree in counseling. Um, she's brilliant. And to be honest, I thought she was Italian. It turned out that she was Spanish, but that's my template. My template is someone that looks like my wife. If I had engaged in a violent sexual experience, like we had said, it may mess up my template and everything becomes short-circuited. And so then in Kurt, instead of going towards my natural template, which in this case is smart Italian looking women, um, I might find myself engaging in um, sexual behaviors with men because my template has been like short-circuited or another way that you could look at it is just having unresolved trauma. Um, let's see, how effective is couples therapy for people in relationships where one person has a sex addiction? I'm seeing 147, is that true? Do we have like 15 minutes, Esther? No, you're until three. You're good. Thank you. You're Sorry. Welcome. Brain freeze. <laughs> That's I'm like, right. oh my God. I'm like, how did I just blow through all this time? You're fine. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I think it's Kiara. This is my old man eyes. Um, how effective? I think that's a brilliant question. I think you would have... Your, a guiding principle would be, what would you do for couples therapy if someone was, say, a heroin addict? Often in situations like that, the bottom line is boundaries. So the couples therapy, I believe, has to focus on the boundaries. The partner has to feel safe. And then the question is, so for instance, if I was in a relationship with my partner and my partner was engaging, was the sex addict, the question for me would be A, what is an acceptable risk? B, what do I need in order to feel safe? Um, and C, how much am I willing to put up with? Um, so I think I would probably use a model that would be similar to substance abuse. Um, Rob, you had said, if the behavior is identified as acting out a childhood trauma, then by definition, should the behavior then be considered unhealthy? Um, well, I guess that's really up to the person. You know, if someone finds that empowerment by acting out that sexual trauma in a manner in which is safe and among consenting adults, on principle, I would think that it could be considered healthy. However, in the practical component, Rob, I think the reality is that it's probably going to be unhealthy. However, in principle, in my, I'm really just giving my opinion at this point, but if someone's reenacting the trauma and they feel like they're empowered by reenacting the trauma and they feel like they're becoming healthy and they're working through the issues, they're working through the stress, they're working through the irritability and it's among consenting adults, then sure, maybe that's the way to go. Um, I think that would be a difficult path for many people, but um, on principle, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, all right, your stream patients. 
Yeah, yeah, Michelle, I agree with you that the fetishes often come into play with abuse. Sometimes I find the fetishes to be really interesting in that there's no, like I've, I've worked with a lot of guys who are just like, I have no idea that why that's my fetish. It doesn't make any sense to them. Um, I'm thinking particularly the one with the, the glove fetish or people that I've known with the foot fetish. All the way into early childhood, do they remember having this fetish and um, they just can't really explain it. It just, it is what it is. Uh, before we do old school, let's see. Roy, when a husband is working towards stopping viewing porn, is having his wife as an accounting pill accountability partner a good thing or not? Roy, many people do that. And I think this is where couples counseling might be helpful. I think this really becomes a, an issue for the couple. The problem with the accountability partner and particularly with the software that people can use to be accountable is that often the software picks up stuff that the, that the person really didn't do. Um, so for instance, I'm working with a client right now and his wife said, you're lying. I know you're lying because this text shows that you're lying. And, but he was saying, well, I, I did like two dozen texts that day. How come there's only one text? What happened to all the other texts? Or I know sometimes that in the background, a computer may try to do something like get on social media. And so the person doesn't try to get on social media, but it's happening in the background. And so it will pop up as someone was acting out when in reality, they're not. And I think that's the biggest problem with having someone being an accountability partner, that's your spouse. I think your accountability partner has to be able to flush out when something probably was acting out and when they're not. If your computer said that you tried getting under Facebook one time and it happens every now and then, and you're able to look at all the other data to show that it does appear to be unusual, they probably weren't. But I think that's um, that can be very difficult to having the wife being an accountability partner. Um, I think it gets back to what does the partner need in order to feel safe and what boundaries do they need? But if I were to come up with a general rule, I would say the accountability partner should be someone else. Um, and then what's something that's common is that if a person acts out, the spouse will often say, you need to tell me immediately, or I don't want to know. Or what they will sometimes say is, you need to tell me within 24 hours. Um, those are common things that partners do in order to feel safe. So as a general rule, the, I would say the answer is no. But if, if a partner feels like they need that in order to be feel safe, then, then that's what they need for their that's for them in their own coupleship. That's for them and their family, what they think is best. So here we're gonna get into old school and new school on sex addiction. Old school, um, old school sex addiction is that they typically, the person had significant trauma. It could be sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. The sexual abuse was incredibly common. An old school model for sex addiction, there was often the comorbidity with um, mental health, whether it be bipolar or generalized anxiety. There was often significant substance abuse with attachment. Old school model for looking at, uh, for conceptualizing sex addiction was that they often came from families that either had boundaries that were too enmeshed or they had families that were too, um, too rigid. And because the family structure was too rigid, it set them up for excuse me, using their sexuality um, as a coping mechanism. The, um, also with using that model for what I'm calling quote unquote old school model for sex addiction where you have trauma, comorbidity, substance abuse, attachment disorder, their length of treatment is usually pretty significant amount of time. Um, they're probably talking about years of therapy. So now we have a problem 
where we have high speed internet. You know, when I grew up, we had the Sears catalog and we had um, National Geographic. I'm wondering if there's other people that can relate to the Sears catalog. Uh, if you wanna throw that in the chat, if you can relate to what I'm saying, that's great. Um, but now we have people that are literally, we have children walking around with phones in their pocket that have graphic, explicit access to online pornography. Is that hope? Yeah, hope, you and me. Michelle, absolutely. <laughs> you know where I'm coming from. We had, uh, yeah, National Geographic was so exciting. JC Penny, that's what we're talking about. So anyway, so if we use the example, we had the previous question of someone acting out, they were sexually abused by someone who was their peer, and then even though they're attracted to um, the opposite gender, they're still acting out with people of the same sex compulsively. The challenge now is that we have people who are engaging in um, engaging in behaviors that are lighting up the brain in a manner which is unhealthy. So I like to think of, take the example of a boy is nine years old. He has a sexual experience with other, another nine-year-old boy. The problem is that nine-year-old boy, we're called abuser, the abuser himself was being abused by a, a man. So a man ab abuses a nine-year-old boy. The nine-year-old boy reenacts that sexual experience with a friend who is of the similar age. That reenactment will often light up the brain in a manner that is really unhealthy. Your brain is just physically unable to deal with that emotionally, neurologically, physiologically, it's not able to handle it. There's often, you know, children do have a sexuality. However, it's immature. It's supposed to be immature. And when they're exposed to explicit sexual experiences at a young age, the analogy that I like is that it's like you took a remote control, you took out the AA battery and you hooked up a car battery and it fries the system. So the challenge now with quote unquote new school addiction is that we have these people, these, in my mind, they're kids, they're teenagers, they're in their 20s, they're in their 30s now. Um, in my mind, you're a kid. I'm, I'm a pop-up now. Uh, if anyone wants to see a picture of my granddaughter, I'm happy to show it to you. I'm very excited to be a pop-up. But anyway, um, these, these people are now being exposed to graphic pornography at the ages of like nine. 10, 11, it used to be that like your friend's father had a Playboy and you, you know, you snuck in and checked it out at like the age of 10. Well, now we're having hardcore pornography that people are seeing at the age of seven. And it's really easy to do. I can remember, um, I know one guy that was looking up animals I think he was doing like pond animals and looked up beavers. I know another person who, I don't know if it's still true, but if you wanted to look up the White House, it's whitehouse.gov. And if you do whitehouse.com, it's a porn site. So these are why people are stumbling across these sites. And even if they were completely innocent, they're now intrigued and it becomes a, a very real problem. Um, in terms of new school sex addiction, for the first time in the history of humanity, it's very common for 20-year-old um, men, I'll call them boys, they're men, well, we'll say they're 20-year-old men, to be having erectile dysfunction with their partners. And it's as a result of what is known as the super normal. No partner can compete with the internet. And because they can't compete with the internet, when they actually have a partner, it's just not as ex exciting. And they actually have erectile dysfunction. It's like the first time in the history of mankind that this is becoming a very real problem. 
and I've worked with these clients. I have a 24 year old client right now. And he talks about how it's happened to him on several occasions. Um, in terms of the treatment for this new school sex addiction, they often don't have as complicated a, um, as complicated a situation. They often don't have the substance abuse. They don't, the trauma that they have is because they were exposed to graphic pornography, which is traumatic in, excel, in itself, but they don't also have the bipolar, which is compounding the issues. They are often able to um, need support for a shorter period of time instead of years and years you're talking about what sometimes could be months to a year or two. And they're able to develop different relationships with themselves, with their sexuality, and with their partners. Um, in fact, there's something called the No FAP movement, F-A-P. Um, FAP is a slang term that people use in, um, I want to say manga. Um, I think it's Japanese cartoons. And it meant, it meant if someone was masturbating. And so the No FAP movement is people that are committed to not engaging in pornography and masturbation because they feel like it has become problematic and they do what's known as a reset. So they try to not engage in pornography and masturbation for 90 days so that way their brain can heal. Um, let's see if we have other questions. Um, so there was one a little bit further up where it was um, about Let's see. Easy access to porn for kids can create some addiction and serious issues that may have other, may not have otherwise occurred. So you kind of covered that. Yes, Pam, you're dead on. Totally agree with you. It can create a very real problem. And, you know, to, to explain how real a problem this is, um, I'm on a list server for, um, for sex addiction therapists. Uh, this one is through ITAP, I-I-T-A-P, and, um, oh, I'm sorry, no, this was a different list server I was on. I was on ATSA, which is the Association for the Treatment and Prevention of Sexual Abuse. I know it doesn't quite match up with the letters, they changed it. And so the woman is a sex offender treatment provider, and her daughter was sitting next to her on the computer talking to a man who was grooming her to abuse her. And she was kind of dumbfounded. Like she couldn't believe this is literally happening in front of her. She's literally sitting next to the girl. And so I think the question that we have is A, first of all, well, it's not really a question. Um, that's certainly scary. And... <sighs> I think regrettably, it just comes down to, in a lot of cases, we can do things to support our children. We can put blocks on our children or blocks on the phones. We can use filters. However, the one thing that I will say to all sex addicts is that not a single filter will ever, ever, ever keep you sober. And if certainly if adults can get around filters, you know, kids can get around filters. So I think a lot of it has to do with teaching children how to have boundaries and how to deal with situations that are inappropriate. As a 12-year-old girl, you shouldn't be talking about sex with a grown man or a stranger on the internet. Um, and it's, um, it's a really difficult problem. Um, but, you know, as parents, I think the important thing is that we tell ourselves that we do the best that we can. Um, all right, treatment modalities. Um, a lot of these treatment modalities, um, Kimberly, I'll get to you in a minute. A lot of these treatment modalities, EMDR has been shown to be very um, effective because often with sex addiction, whether, um, and I, I hope it's becoming clear that when I'm saying sex addiction, I mean all the different ways of sex actually acting out, whether it's with a partner, with a group of partners, with pornography, prostitution, you know, so whether we're talking about sex, love, or relationships, I'm including all that. I'm hoping that's being clear. Um, since trauma is a very, can be a significant 
components of that. EMDR is really helpful. Um, DBT, uh, the chain analysis, the mindfulness that goes with DBT is brilliant. Um, that was put out by Marsha Linehan. I know my understanding of DBT, I've used it. I don't have specific training in it, but it's my understanding that it is really designed for um, for people with suicidal ideation, self-harm, things like that. And they have found it to be very helpful with things like depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. And I would argue that DBT can also be a um, be brilliant with people with sexual compulsivity. ACT, um, I love ACT with the idea of the acceptance and the commitment. Um, ACT really talks about um, being in your values, um, but I think it was Rob who had talked about the gay son. I, I, in my mind, you know, acceptance about these issues is really a fundamental component with finding peace. And particularly for some, if someone's a sex addict, you know, you just need to read your point where you're a sex addict. Um, that's my two cents. If someone really has crossed that line, whether it be alcoholism, drugs, gambling, sex, food, you have to get to the point where you just have to realize and accept the fact that you have a problem. And I really like, I think ACT really promotes that as well as the mindfulness. Um, the mindfulness-based um, cognitive therapy, again, is brilliant. And this is my opinion. I'm totally just saying my opinion. I would love to see if people have other opinions in the chat. But in my opinion, cognitive behavioral therapy is really, really helpful in the beginning, but you, it doesn't necessarily address the underlying issues. I know that there's a lot of research that shows how efficacious it can be. I think adding the mindfulness component to it can be very helpful in the long run. Sometimes I wonder though, if CBT is really efficacious in the long run, because remember, when we're talking about old school sex addiction, we're talking like five plus years of therapy. And for the people that are chronic relapsers, I don't know if cognitive therapy really helps them. Like they know, I have a distorted thinking. I know that if I'm looking for prostitutes, that's a distorted thought that that's going to make me feel better. But a lot of times that their treatment needs move beyond that. But um, I really like the mindfulness that's in both DBT ACT and um, mindfulness cognitive therapy. Um, and on a personal level, I think cognitive therapy is brilliant and important, especially for the beginning. The internal family systems, I'm, IFS is brilliant. I've been learning a lot about it. The whole idea that you have different parts and, you know, when we talk about the acceptance and commitment therapy, you know, part of IFS, and I'm saying this really humbly, if I'm not coming across humbly, I would, <laughs> let me stress that. But the great thing about IFS is that an addict, an addiction is a maladaptive coping strategy that probably worked at one point. Um, and so the idea of thanking the addict part, thank you for keeping me feeling safe. Thank you for helping me um, deal with my stress and showing compassion to the addict and then trying to have a different part come forward, you know, whether we're talking about the exiles, the managers or whatever. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, look up IFS. It's brilliant. I think it's the most brilliant thing that I've seen in a long time. Um, RPP Addiction 101, that's relapse prevention. Addiction 101. Go to meetings, find a sponsor, journal, make a relapse prevention plan. So all the things that you would do with your substance abuse clients, that addiction 101 is great as a treatment modality. Um, DBT skill building. Sarah, you asked about CPT. You know, someone actually just mentioned that to me. I don't know enough about it. Um, you know, if someone wants to jump in, if you have found CPT to be helpful, I would love to hear it. Um, I just, I don't know about enough about it in order to comment on it. Um, I'm totally blanking on what RT is. 
Is that rec just, recreational therapy? I don't R remember. The REBT is fantastic. Oh, reality therapy. Oh, reality therapy. Um, thank you very much for all of you um, reminding me. I, I don't know enough about it to say. Um, it certainly might be helpful, but I really don't know. Um, all right, Kimberly, you said, what does therapy look like to the child age seven after severe sexual abuse from toddl toddlerhood to five to six years old? How do you get the remote back to using AA batteries or AA batteries? Um, it's kind of funny, AA batteries. I'm sure that there's some sort of Freudian slip in there. Um, Kimberly, that is such an awesome question. In my mind, first of all, I don't have, I'm not going to claim any expertise in, in childhood, in child therapy. I was an elementary school year school teacher for 20 years, but um, in terms of how you help that client, um, Kimberly, I'm wondering if you probably have far more answers than I do if these are the types of clients that you work with. I think teaching the child to have appropriate boundaries is probably the way to go. I think teaching the child to learn how to deal with um, stress and things like that, giving them the tools. I have a feeling if we look at these treatment modalities that I have on the screen where we have addiction 101, in your case, Kimberly, I would write, I would argue as someone that really, this is just a shot in the dark, whatever you do for a child age seven that has significant sexual abuse, whatever you normally would do would probably be the most efficacious thing that you could do for that child. If that child develops, um, you know, if an addiction model is helpful for that child later on in their life, then that's great. I think one of the questions, Kimberly, that I feel like you're bringing up, whether you meant to or not, is, um, is what do you do with the 16-year-old that's masturbating every day? I think of that as what would you do with a freshman who's drinking every weekend? I think the freshman who is drinking every weekend when you're 30 years old, 40 year old, 50 year old, and you're still drinking like you're a freshman in college, you're probably an alcoholic. Maybe not, maybe you're just a heavy drinker, but it's, I think at that point you can analyze and ask yourself, have I crossed the line into an addiction? The problem with the 16 year old that's constantly looking at pornography and masturbating they may be learning poor coping mechanisms and poor coping skills, and they may be learning things in pornography that women don't like, but they think that they like. However, a lot of that is probably developmentally appropriate in terms of feeling hypersexual. Um, so one of the things that I'm interpreting from the question about the seven-year-old is that what if that seven-year-old is constantly engaging in sexual behaviors and showing sexual compulsivity, I think that um, it takes time to find out if they really have crossed that line into addiction. And I would be hesitant to call a seven-year-old a sex addict, just like I would be hesitant to call a 16 Um you know, I did know of a young female, she was 19 years old, um, and her sexual behaviors probably would be equitable to a 40-year-old lifelong sex-addicted man, meaning that the number of partners she had and the level of her use of pornography and masturbation was so extreme you probably could say that she had crossed that line into sex addiction. Whereas I would often hesitate to label someone as a sex addict and you know, labels only go so far. In her case, I think it's a, I think it's a fair assessment and using an addiction model would probably be really helpful for that person. 
Um, all right. Yeah. Um, masturbating in school in front of others. Yeah. Yeah. She's it. That's horrific. Um, it, she will end up influencing the other children. Um, she will also, um, people will then start looking at her differently. Um, the children's parents won't want them around that girl, that kind of thing. That sounds horrible. And I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, Lauren, I think you guys are all asking great questions. All right. So how to get help. Um, as clinicians, I really like ITAP, the International Institute for Trauma and Addiction Professionals. Um, in my mind, I know I'm biased. In my mind, that's the gold standard for sex addiction treatment. Um, I am, I have qualified for an ASAC, which is the Associate Sex Addiction Therapist. The Certified Sex Addiction Therapist is the one that, um, you know, would be considered like a higher level. I think to become a CSAT, um, you need to have worked with sex addicts for five years. You need to have a master's degree in counseling. You need to have 30 hours of supervision. You need to go through um, four modules. The modules are one week each. Um, is there anything else? There may be. I might be thinking of some. Oh, and you also need to be a, have a full license. That's the one thing that I'm missing right now. I just got my license in May, so I'm an associate clinician in Delaware, and I'm working under the supervision of uh, Dr. Jennifer Weeks in Pennsylvania. In my mind, it's the gold standard, but I know that I'm completely prejudiced. The Society for the Advancement of Sexual Health (SASH). It's a great um, society. The people that worked at Keystone were really involved with SASH. Um, I know that they do really great work. I'm not part of it, so I can't really say anything other than they've got a great reputation and they do great work. The American Association for Sex Addiction Therapy, I've heard of it. It has a good reputation in my mind, but I, I'll be honest with you, I really don't know anything about it other than it has a good reputation. Um, so when we start looking for help for the clients, you know, we have the residential, we have IOP. IOP is, um, there's just not that many of them. There is an IOP that's in um, New York. New York Pathways has an IOP. I know that I would like to develop an IOP. Um, as far as I know, there are a few IOPs that are specifically for sex addiction. They are there, they're definitely there, but there's not that many. When you compare it to substance abuse, it's just, I would even wonder, I would question if there's 1% of the same level, the frequency of IOPs that focus on sex addiction as opposed to um, substance abuse. Oh, you know, no, I think um, STAR, Sexual Trauma and Recovery, they're up in Wynwood. I don't think they have an IOP. They have a lot of really good groups, but they do not have, in my mind, IOP is like nine plus hours of group therapy. If someone has a different definition and you'd like to throw it in the chat, I'm more than happy to hear it. But I thought IOP, maybe it's six hours. Anyway, IOP for sex addiction is rare, but they definitely do have it. So then you have individual and group therapy. Um, as a general rule, I think the group therapy can be really helpful for many people. So if someone has to choose, I think the group therapy tends to be more efficacious, particularly because it's cheaper. Uh, but sometimes people just aren't ready for group. They're not a good fit and they really need to work on their own individual things, in which case the individual therapy has to go first. There are 12 steps for specifically for sex addiction. Um, SA is called Sex Sexaholics Anonymous and SLAA is Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. Those are the two fellowships that are in Delaware. Um, it used to be 
what happens, let me backtrack a little bit. When it comes to your sexuality, you know, I know a guy that he was allowed to have, he had an open relationship with his boyfriend, but as long as his boyfriend knew about it, that was considered healthy. And if the boyfriend didn't know about it, that was considered unhealthy and addictive behavior. There are other people who think of just objectifying people and masturbation is unhealthy. So those are two very different um, ideas. And so as a result of it, there are lots of different fellowships have started. For instance, with AA, you could take a bath in alcohol as long as it doesn't touch your mouth or your lips, you're still sober, even though you took a bath in alcohol. And I think most people would agree with that. And so you have one fellowship, it's called Alcoholics Anonymous. Whereas with sex, because there's so many different ways of interpreting sexuality, there are lots of different groups for it. Now, because of COVID, it's now, there is no excuse for not getting to a 12 step meeting for sexual compulsivity. There used to be, I believe, five or six meetings in Delaware, and they were all in Northern Delaware. Um, but now with Zoom, literally you can do a 12 step meeting for sex addiction at any time of day throughout the world. Um, other groups are uh, Sex Addicts Anonymous, Sexual Compulsivity Anonymous, Sex and Porn Addicts Anonymous. Refuge Recovery, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, I think that's the one that's got like um, a Buddhist type to it. They do like guided meditations. They really work on um, the, I want to say the four pillars, but I could be wrong. But refuge recovery is one of those things that's brilliant for all addictions. Celebrate recovery is kind of like if um, we take the 12 steps and we put a Christian spin on it. Um, that can be very, a lot of people find it helpful. Smart recovery, I thought smart recovery is not religiously based at all. Um, I'm really not sure if anyone wants to correct me, I would love to hear it, but I know that some people find that helpful. Um, let's see, let's just go back. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say you have a few comments in there as well as some questions. All right. Um, Lauren, I think it's a great question about if the girl was being abused in front of other people. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you, um, is it Alexa? Alexa, you said that you see excessive behaviors more of people with some trauma past. Absolutely. I, I think you're absolutely. Child who is compulsively masturbating needs an evaluation by a pediatrician. Um, Linda, I think that's a great comment needing to rule out the, um, the medical component, I think is very important. You know, a perfect example, I wanna be really clear. We all know that I'm not a doctor, but I thought that some medications for Parkinson's can really bring out um, gambling addiction. So Linda, when I see you saying that they need to see a pediatrician or an endocrinologist, um, I think that's a perfect example. Sometimes there's a medic, a very real medical thing that has absolutely nothing to do with addiction. Um, thoughts on ASAC for sex addiction treatment. I thought it was good. Berkeley, I think it's Berkeley. My understanding is that that's a pretty reputable um, association. I don't know anything about it but I've always heard positive things about it. And I've never, well, let me put it this way. I've never heard anything negative about it. I thought it was, had some really good stuff. I just don't know. Um, so Esther, you said IOP is three hours a day, three days a week. That was when I did my internship, it was nine hours. Um, so let's see, Rob, you said we do a three day couples IOP and three day advocacy intensive faith-based in Easton, Maryland. Thank you, Rob, for sharing that. And it sounds like if you've got 15 clients right now, you probably, uh, I, you probably have some really good experience with this. Um, can you address, yes, Hector. Oh, Hector, it's so good to see you. Um, 
Okay, so let's go to Deb first. Deb, you said, can I assure my sex addict that the Zoom 12-step meetings can indeed be anonymous? I would assure nobody of nothing. However, I always thought you can. You turn off your picture, you change the name. I thought you can, but um, for a very hot minute, I was a web designer. And the one thing that I learned as a web designer is that everything is breakable and everything is hackable. So I think you can guarantee nothing. That being said, I can't imagine someone going to 12-step meetings with that much technological know-how, just trying to figure out who in the Zoom meeting is hiding. So Deb, I would tell my clients, I, th I think you should feel pretty confident about that as far as anything that you're doing. But um, yeah, I, I think too, um, I think to say that, um, to say that it's, it's a guarantee, that's not, I don't believe that that's true, but I find it difficult to believe that someone would be able to figure out who someone is if they change the name and they don't have the picture up. Um, my problem is that I forget, <laughs> I would then like turn the video on by accident, <laughs> but that's a me thing, that's not a, a your client thing. Hector, you had asked about the different 12 step groups. So the different 12 step groups have more in common than they do differences, but there are differences. So for instance, as far as I know, only two of the fellowships tell you what it means to be sober. Sexaholics Anonymous SA tends to have as a fellowship, the strictest definition, meaning no sex out, no sex with self, no sex outside of marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman and progressive victory over lust. While that may sound remarkably draconian to people that, you know, if we're trying to be pro-sex, um, you know what, some people find that that works for them for their religious beliefs, but it also works for them because many sex addicts will have sexual contact with someone of the same gender, but they're really a sex addict. They're not gay. They're not gay and they're not bi. It's a matter of their sexual compulsivity having zero boundaries, or it could be trauma reenactment, but it's not a result of your orientation. So I think that's why a lot of people essay works for them because they shouldn't be acting out with someone out of their marriage and they shouldn't be having sexual interactions with people of the same gender because they're heterosexual. Spa, my understanding, spa is the only other one that defines the sexual, the sobriety definition. So whereas alcohol, no drinking is your sobriety definition for alcohol, for Alcoholics Anonymous. In spa, it's no sex outside of a committed relationship, no use of pornography, and then they have something called an edging, um, which means like you're doing things that would get you to cross your um, your bottom line of no um, no looking at pornography. So, like I said, so there's only two that I know of that actually define sobriety. That's SA and SPAA. That being said, people will often misinterpret that. For instance, if you're a porn addict, you shouldn't be looking at porn. So in SLAA, they let you define your own sobriety, but many people in SLAA will actually have a stricter definition of sobriety than the people that are in the supposedly more rigorous groups. So SA says, no sex with self, no sex outside of marriage, and progressive victory over lust. I know someone who said that if he opened up an email that looked like it had a sexual, something sexual in the subject line, if he opened up that email, that was a relapse for him. And for many of us, that may sound like absolutely ridiculous opening up an email. But when someone's looking at pornography for eight hours a day and they're using emails to do it, in that context, it makes more sense. 
in that context, someone would have a stricter sexual sobriety definition than what SA would necessarily tell you. So the bottom line in my mind is, is the meeting helpful or not? In Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, they tend to have more of a focus on love addiction, but all of them talk about love addiction. So if someone feels like they're struggling with relationships, I would hope that they could go to any S fellowship, take what you want, leave the rest, and hope that they get something out of it. Um, so in all the other fellowships, as far as I know, you define, you decide what it means to be sober. However, to be clear, you really shouldn't be deciding what sober is on, on your own. You should do it with your therapist and you should do it with your sponsor. And that if you just do it on your own, you have to remember that you're an addict and we tend to lie to ourselves. So maybe you should try to do things differently. Um, let's see, Will, you said refuge. Yeah, celebrate recovery is Christian principles. Refuge is Buddhist principles. That's, Will, your understanding is the same understanding as mine. Um, SA approach can work in conjunction with Karn's approach to brain detox of the addictive coping behavior. Absolutely, Rob, I would agree with that. I think all of them work really well with Patrick Carnes. Um, I think we're about to talk about Patrick Carnes. We'll talk about Patrick Carnes in a minute. But yeah, I would agree with you, Rob, that um, all of the fellowships, I believe, work really well with Patrick Carnes' model. I wanted to touch on paraphilic disorders just because that's something that's um, often um, what throws people off. And it's the only thing that's really in the DSM-5. So I take that back. I know that there's other things that are related to sex, but the paraphilic disorders are an atypical sexual interest or behavior. And it's a paraphilic disorder, meaning it's a mental disorder stemming from the atypical behavior. So the paraphilia, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm not reading this correctly. The paraphilia is that it's atypical and a paraphilic disorder means that it's the mental disorder that stems from it. It's my understanding that all of these things, what makes it a, paraf a, uh, a paraphilic disorder, excuse me, what makes it a paraphilic disorder is that it offends your own values or it offends someone else's values. So for instance, uh, voyeurism, that would be like the cameras, the peeping, the exhibitionism. Um, I think we, we probably know what a lot of these are. Frauderism, uh, pop quiz, does anyone know what frauderism is? We'll come back to that. Um, transvestitism is a um, great, great guess, but it, it's uh, not necessarily the foot, but I love the guess. Transvestism, I think is a really interesting paraphilic disorder. What makes it so interesting in my mind is that, well, first of all, it's only men wearing women's clothing. I kind of have a problem with that, but anyway, we'll set that aside. The problem with transvestism is that someone wears or someone has a sexual attraction to women's clothing. In my mind, if someone has an attraction to women's clothing, then, you know, so be it. That's their attraction. If it's a real fetish, then so be it. I don't think there's a cure for fetishes. That's just my two cents. You can, relearn, you can learn to have a different relationship. And maybe if someone, if a man is dressing up in women's clothing and they find it sexually arousing, maybe the treatment for them is to learn how to accept their fetish, whether they're doing it or not doing it, maybe that would be a good treatment goal. The thing with it being a paraphilic disorder is when it really goes, like if the person really does not want to do it and it's a compulsivity. So I know someone that engages with wearing women's clothing and it's sexually attractive to him or it's sexual sexual interest of his it is probably trauma-based 
However, at the same time, he has crossed that line into sex addiction as well. And so it may be helpful for him if he had a different relationship with his fetish and be able to accept his fetish. And it would be helpful for him to work on his trauma as even if he were to come to a better understanding of his fetish, he would still probably be a sex addict. So I think that's the thing with transvestivism, I think I'm saying that correctly, is that really has to do with you don't want to do it. Um, with pedophilia, it's just an attraction to people that are pubescent or younger. Um, did we get frauderism? Oh, we got someone Googled it, rubbing your privates against someone else without their permission. Absolutely unacceptable or invited uh, uh, or the, the touching. Um, you, I totally agree with you, Rob. It can be a friendly hug, making a friendly hug sexual. That's right. Instead of getting the old two patter, it's the, hey, it's so good to see you. That's creepy. Don't do that. Um, yeah, I think of it as the crowded subway is frauderism. Um, the thing that is, I think, notable about pedophilia is that people will often say that if you have an attraction to 14 and 15 year olds, I think by definition, that is not pedophilia. I believe that is hebophilia or hebophilia. I've heard both people pronounce it differently. But in the nomenclature, People always say that if someone's acting out with a teenager and they're a pedophile, it's my understanding that that is technically not correct. And by definition, if someone is 15 and 16 years old, it may be illegal, it may be immoral, and it may be against your values. And it may be offensive, but it's not pedophilia. Um, Frauderism is something I saw a lot when I worked in brain injury. Yeah, Esther, I'm not surprised to hear that. Um, any experience someone, I do have some experience working with someone with sex addiction and baby diapers. I think the problem that that client had, Deborah, was that um, the problem with that client was that he also had a urophilia and a, a diaper fetish. And so he was peeing all over the place. Like he was peeing all over the sofa, the, you know, the TV room, he was peeing everywhere. And what became interesting was that he claimed that he had a medical diagnosis, certainly could be true. But even if you have a medical diagnosis with um, with incontinence, you shouldn't be peeing all over the sofa, for instance. Um, what's it, would you say some people who gamble for long hours wearing diapers? That is exactly true. That is so true. I've heard that before. Um, so I think the challenge with Deborah, the, the client that I'm thinking of, is that he was so pre-contemplative but his behavior was so offensive to everyone around him that it, um, I mean, it destroyed his marriage. It destroyed his relationship with his children. He couldn't hold a job, um, you know, but he was so pre-contemplative, you know, whether someone's an addict or not. I mean, there's, you know, sometimes, I don't know, the labels are helpful, sometimes they're not, but you know, if someone's just into wearing diapers, that's great. If that's what you want to do and it's fun and whatnot, then yeah, uh, go for it. If if it's destroying your marriage, maybe that's something that you should get into therapy for is my two cents. I think that's everything. Um, okay. So is peeing in cups or jars related to a sexual addiction? Can I relate? It's a great question. I have no idea. Um, maybe they just don't like stopping for long drives. Uh, maybe it's a poor coping mechanism. Um, yeah, Alexa, I would agree with you. It depends on why they're doing it. Um, if you're looking for other resources, Rob had talked about Patrick Carnes. Patrick Carnes changed 
like it's kind of hard. I feel like it's hard to really um, appreciate how much Patrick Carnes did for people who struggle with sexual compulsivity. And I don't say that in a way in which I'm trying to like brown nose. Besides the research that he did, besides all of the books that he's written, besides the fact that he helped start Keystone, which is in Chester, I think he also helped start um, the facility in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I think he also, there's another one, I want to say like Minnesota or something, I don't remember. He has not only started several residential treatment facilities, but the research that he did really gave a great start. And now there's lots of people with lots of, um, there's lots of people with lots of expertise. But if you're looking for books, Patrick Carnes, his daughter, Dr. Stephanie Carnes has also put out a lot of really good books. Um, some, uh, Roy Reed is someone that I, I like a lot of his research. Um, and I really like the fact that Rory Reed takes an attitude of like, let's not jump the gun and just assume that everything is a sex addiction. I like his discretion. Um, he is very much what are the, what do the numbers say? You know, what are, what are the, what are, what's the research saying? Um, there's a couple of other books that I would really recommend also. Um, Dr. Alex Katahakis, she's someone that I did some training with. She's got some great books. Uh, a Katahakis, um, K-A-T. She, let me see. Um, her book, she's got a book on eroticism, which is very much, I consider pro, um, pro-sex, very much like pro-sexual um, so what I'm looking for. It's very much being healthy with your sexuality. She also wrote a really thick book. It's awesome. I, I definitely, I have to read it often with a uh, dictionary because of all the books that she has, or because of all the big words, but she is called uh, Affect Dysregulation for, or Sex Addiction and Affect Dysregulation. That's a brilliant book really gets into um, attachment disorders, really gets into the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, uh, dorsal vagal system, stuff like that. So she's got some good stuff. Facing the shadows, if you're looking for anything, write down the name, Facing the Shadows. It's a great workbook. Um, yeah, I think that those are other ones. Karns worked with, Doc, with Mark Lasser. Yes, I've heard of that. Um, I'm not as familiar with it, but I definitely have heard that as well. Um, thank you. It looks like, is that Jose or Joseph? Thank you, Joseph, for your kind words. Can you please list these names? Sure. Lost connection. Um, okay. So yeah, Patrick Carnes here. Uh, everyone. So it's Patrick Carnes. It's Stephanie Carnes. It's, whoa, I'm not sure what I just typed. Alex Katahakis. I know I misspelled it. Oh, we're doing all caps now. Alex Katahakis. I know it's wrong, but you can, that'll get you started. Um, let me see. I have some other books too. Facing the Shadow is really, really great. Um, let's see if I can get these books up here. Come on. Oh, there's another book. I really like this book. Um, here, you know what? I'm just going to share my screen again for a minute. Um, Out of the Shadows, absolutely. A lot of the stuff that Patrick Carnes did is very old school now and very much outdated on some things, but it really, like, he's really describing it well. Um, so I would recommend some of those things as well. Um, let's see, bum, bum. All right, so this one, Cyber Sex Unplugged, great book, highly recommend it. 
that's how you spell catahakis, K-A-T-E-H-A-K-I-S. Um, she also wrote the book on erotic intelligence, I think is what it's called. It's great. She's really nice. She's got a really good practice out in California. Um, of course, I can't remember it now. Addictive thinking. That one I like. I've started using that with my clients. Addictive thinking is a um, really can be used for any addicts. I liked it tremendously by Tversky, T-W-E-R-S-K-I. Um, don't call it love. That's a that's a really that's a great book. If you're looking for anything, I would read Don't Call It Love. If you're looking for something for a client facing the shadow. Those are um, the two biggest things that I would recommend. Um, so anyway, we're about an hour and 45 minutes in. I know that this is remarkably controversial. Um, it's a remarkably controversial topic. I know that many people have very strong feelings about it. And um, <laughs> I prefer that you not blast me in the chat. Um, do we have questions? Now feels like a really great time to ask the most random questions that you may have.